Welcome to the broadcast. Governor Bill Clinton worked his way from a middle-class childhood to become a Rhodes Scholar, a graduate of Yale Law School, and is now the front runner of the Democratic Party's race for president. At the age of 30, he was elected Attorney General of his native state of Arkansas, and two years later became the nation's youngest governor. In 40 years, his national prestige led to post as chairman of the Democratic Leadership Council and the National Governors Association. Governor Clinton's long tenure has been noted for efforts to improve education, including a te teacher testing program. After Paul Songas dropped out of the race, the field briefly seemed clear for Governor Clinton. But in next week's New York State primary, he faces the greatest challenge yet in this campaign against the growing popularity of former California Governor Jerry Brown. Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton joins us now to talk about what he would do if he was elected president and the campaign he sees ahead. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Glad to see you. Glad to uh, be back. It is good to see you again. A friend of yours, Robert Reich, who Harvard uh, professor at the Kennedy School of Government, told me a story uh, when he was on this broadcast about the two of you on a boat going to London as new Rhodes Scholars. Uh, tell me about that trip. It was wonderful for us, you know. Back then, they used to try to get everybody to go on a liner. And most of us had, many of us had never been to New York before, and uh, I had, but many of them hadn't. And we sailed out of New York Harbor. And uh, it was a six day trip on an ocean liner, a wonderful opportunity um, to just kind of be idle, get to know each other, get to know other people on the boat, anticipate going to England and going to Oxford, which was a an awesome thing to think about, you know, when you're 22 years old, you just, it's, even now it gives me chills to think about how excited I was then. He and got sick. He got sick, You yeah. took care of him. Yeah, well, I, he got really sick. He, he would, a lot of them got seasick, or several people did, but a little bit, but Bob was real sick. Yeah. And uh, he was stuck in the cabin. The rest of us were outside having fun, playing games, you know, laughing and joking. And, so I would go by and take him soup, soup and stuff and yeah. tea and sit and visit with him. I could tell he was a brilliant man. He was fascinating. And I, I was, as everybody who knows him, I was just captivated by him. And he, so I spent some good personal time with him because of his illness that maybe we never would have spent otherwise. And I've remained close friends with him over almost 25 years now. He said to me that one of those conversations, you both talked about dreams for the future and that you talked about Oxford, perhaps going to law school, going back to Arkansas and getting involved in politics and hopefully having state office during the 1980s and running for president and being president of the country in the 90s. Did you think about it then? Was it part of, of the vision or the dream of a young Bill Clinton even then? Well, what I was thinking about mostly then was just whether I could go home and be in politics. You know, I. I came from a middle class family, as you pointed out, a family with no real political connections. And I had worked for my senator, Senator Fulbright, and I just always wanted to do that. It was what, from the time I was 16 years old. It's funny because I think it's, it made people more suspicious of me now because we've been so disappointed in our politicians for so long. But when I was a child growing up, it was a good thing to want to be in politics. I mean, uh, Truman was president when I was born. Eisenhower was our national father figure. And John Kennedy promised to get the country moving again. It was only when we had our problems with Vietnam and civil rights and Watergate and Iran, and then we elected uh, President Reagan who said that politics was basically a bad thing, government was a bad thing, that we began this long national disillusionment with our public figures, which I always thought was sad. But anyway, when I was a kid growing up, the idea that you might actually be given the opportunity to serve the people by winning an election was an extraordinary and positive thing. Against that background, when you think of that and, and what politics meant to you then and why you wanted to go into politics and, and what the compelling quality of it was and with those kinds of heroes and those kinds of leaders, what is it that, um, how is it to run for president? What's your day like today? Uh, I saw Governor Brown last night on this broadcast he came in here and he said to me, I don't know what time I got up this morning. He said, I'm exhausted. He said uh, he was very alert during the broadcast, but he hadn't had any dinner. And I thought, my God, the price you pay for the crown. Well, I think both of us have probably had more frayed nerves than we wish we had. 
and it makes you a little bit edgy and sometimes a little bit too uh, temperamental. You have to watch, really watch, just not getting too tired, too exhausted, because there are a lot of pressures. I got up this morning, Hillary and I got up about 6, a little before she left early on a campaign swing. I went to the gym and the hotel and worked out for about a half an hour. Then I did a early morning television interview, two radio interviews. I did the Don Imus show here in New York, you know, a famous <laughs> thing, which I thought was just great. Then I went out to Brooklyn and met with a group of black ministers. Then I went to the Metro Tech Project, an extraordinary project here in Brooklyn, public-private partnership to generate thousands of jobs in a formerly depressed area. Uh, and then I went on with my day, did a lot of other things, including had a massive rally at Wall Street, which I loved. Then I did a couple of uh, editorial boards this afternoon. Then I did a fundraiser. Then I did five feeds and uh, television feeds, and I came to you. And then you go to Nightline after this. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to do Nightline after this. And how is it different than you expected? More privacy loss than I anticipated. I mean, I knew about it, you know, because I've been working for other people in presidential campaigns for 20 years. But it was the, the loss of, of all privacy was greater than I anticipated. And I haven't been able to go home as much as I wanted, and I miss my daughter terribly. I mean, Hillary and I at least are together about half the time, and we knew what we were getting into, but ever since my little girl was just a tiny tot, I've gotten her up in the morning and fed her breakfast, and we've gone off to school together from the time she was in preschool. How does she react when she reads and knows of the things that are being said about you, about character, about image, the caricature of Bill Clinton, her dad? Well, she's pretty tough, my kid is. For one thing, we started out when she was about six, when I was running for governor in a very tough race where people were saying very tough things about me. Role playing at dinner. And I, I told her, I said, Chelsea, you have to take these criticisms seriously, but not personally. You know, if you want to know if somebody says something about me, or come and ask me, but don't take it personally. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make me a bad person. You got to hold on there. And Hillary really helped her with that. So when I ran against these two guys for governor in 86 who were just saying awful things about me and I was wrecking the state school system and all that sort of stuff, she would play one of them and I would play another and Hillary would play me and then we'd all change roles. And she learned to debate issues without letting it damage her self-interest, image. Then last summer when we were thinking about doing this, late August, we went on vacation and I asked my daughter, I said, here's some of the things people will say about me if I run. What'd you tell her? said they would attack me personally. They would say I'd been a bad governor. They might even say I'd done unethical things. And she said, Dad, how could they say that? You've been elected so many times. People have looked at you. And I said, it doesn't matter. Little new. How old is she now? She's, uh, she was 11 then. She's 12. Yeah. And, I said, uh, and I said, plus which I'll be gone a lot. And she said, well, don't worry about what they say about you. She said, I'm a student in the public schools. I've heard it all, <laughs> which I thought was funny. And then she said... In all kinds of language. Yeah. Then she said, well, you know, sometimes if you want to do something for a lot of people, the people who love you have to make a sacrifice, and I think you should run. Yeah. And she has been very tough, and every time something's come up, we've talked to her about it. Yeah. When you look at the image that some have today, because this question has arisen, this question of character, but more importantly, it's a question of who is Governor Clinton. And you have made the point repeatedly that part of this campaign is for you to let the American people get to know you. What is the image? You mentioned politics, and it's because you have thought about politics for a long time, been involved in politics for a long time, there is this notion that this is one more politician. That's one thing. Two, there are other things that are said about you. What of those things, what is the character you see of Bill Clinton that you know you have to change? You mean the caricature? Yeah. yeah. What is the image that you know oh, this is whole unfair business to you? about, you know, he's too slick and maybe he's not honest and maybe we can't trust him. You know, that's sort of stunning to me because even my, my toughest enemies at home, I think, consider me to be a truthful person. And I've always fought for change. The interesting thing is, I have always been a different kind of politician. The way I succeeded in public life in my state, very competitive, very tough, 
was always to be the agent of change, always to be able to be the outsider, always to keep running to change things and make them better. And the truth is, all these other people who portray themselves as anti-politicians, they want to be president. I mean, Ross Perot buys his way into the presidential campaign, it's because he wants to be president. Jerry Brown's been running for president for 16 years. Yeah, but I get the impression that when you look at Brown, this notion of a man who's running an insurrectionist campaign, this man who somehow is saying, I'm against the establishment, I'm an agent of change, your words, I am someone who has listened to the suffering of Americans who are fed up and tired of politics, there's a certain envy when you hear that and you say, that's the song I want to play, and Brown has got my song. And I think unfairly. Why but I think, some, I, mean, why? I think some of it is inevitable. I think, for one thing, give him credit. He has always been able to reinvent himself every year or two, but he's always known where the cutting edge of change was. This 800 number is a brilliant idea, and telling people, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to give you the power to do this. I'm going to let you call in. Your vote counts as much as anybody else. Your call. Using technology to empower people, I think, is the central thing that he's done in this campaign that will endure. But the thing that frustrates me is I won all those early primaries because people thought I represented the right kind of change. They thought I was an outsider who'd actually paid the price. In the 1980s, while he was doing other things, I was out here working for change in the midst of this Reagan-Bush revolution, throwing all this stuff back on the states, giving us yeah. no help. I have done that. I know people who suffer, and I don't have to go any place to find out. I live in a state where people know me by their first name. I go running in downtown Little Rock. Homeless people come up, talk to me about how they became homeless. I mean, I have lived a life that made me an agent of change. His point is, as you know, his point is that, that the central difference between the two of you, it is part of the 800 number, is that he has raised his money from small people. That the money that you have makes you, the, the money that has fueled yeah, but, this campaign and, and this immense organization has created the image that he, with a lot of donations from a lot of small people, is part of a crusade. You, on the other hand, are part of a massive campaign, well organized, well financed, yeah, but, you know, that will make you sort of beholden to people who financed Except it. the people, most of the people who started financing me were people in my home state and people who knew me personally. And to be fair, uh, for, for Jerry, necessity was the mother of invention. The people who knew him weren't going to support him for president. So he had to have a new way of running. And it was a brilliant way that he found. But Is it you know, possible but, that he came to that point of view simply because he did, as he says, without questioning his motives, that this is a man who finally got fed up with politics, as usual, no and said, I don't want to do it that way anymore. I have no. found out that money corrupts politics, no. and I'm going to try to do it a different way. You can't accept that about Jerry Brown? I just don't believe it. I mean, I don't believe it. So he's lying if he says... No, I just don't. I think that he, he believes... He, is all, he likes to be the outsider and the change agent. But, I mean, this is a guy just a year and a half ago who was, filing, who was testifying in a lawsuit in California to set aside contribution limits when I was supporting an amendment in my state to impose them. This is Prop 17. Or yeah, my, my point is, there's not that, you know, the $100 and the $1,000, you know, I don't think that makes me beholden. If a, if a man can be bought off for $1,000, he's yeah. got no business being president of the United States. Does money in corrupt politics in America today? Absolutely. But the reason it does, there are two reasons. First of all, the influence of PACs, which can give five times as much as an individual. Secondly, the sheer cost of campaigns, which makes people spend so much time on it. And thirdly, the absence of direction in Washington from the president engaging the Congress in the real change this country needs means that when there's a vacuum, the interest groups move in and fill it. So I agree with Jerry Brown. There are a lot of changes that need to be made. I do not agree with him that I'm somehow more corrupt because I take $1,000 and he takes $100. i have had over 20,000 contributors in my own state at ten dollars or more. He I mean, says he's raised more money recently than you have. Is that right? I doubt it, but I don't know that. Okay. I don't know how much he's raised. How would a Clinton presidency in its soul, in its, in its mission, be different from a Brown presidency? Well, for one thing, I would be interested in affecting the positive changes that I've talked about in this campaign. I mean, I've actually put a program out there. I've, I've run on more than the way we financed the campaign. And, and Jerry's tax. I would be for a progressive tax system. I would be for giving 
Well, well let, let me talk about my the soul. Let, the, yeah, that's I what think I'm really interested in. I think there are three big proposals. Three really big things here. One is this economy's going in the tubes. The people that are working hard and playing by the rules are getting the shaft. And the big reason is we're the only major country in the world without a national economic strategy led by the president, our leader. So we've got to organize ourselves to meet the competition. So, Because work needs to be rewarded and the idea of progress needs to be restored to America. So that's the first big idea. The second thing that really troubles me is that this country is coming apart at the seams. Our, the fabric of life is disintegrating. For, for people, kids that are being shot in schools, people that are being abandoned. And why is that? There are lots of reasons. Part of it is economic decline. Part of it is the decay of the family and, and the fabric of life in this country. Part of it is the public ethic of the 1980s, which was, you know, turn a quick buck, forget about your neighbors, forget about anybody else, just take care of yourself. Uh, we have to literally rebuild the conditions of civilized life for millions of people. We've got to give children their childhoods back. We've got to make our schools safe and, and free of, of crime and drugs and violence. And, and I believe because of, of the kind of work I've done and the way I've done it, that I can be the healer and the unifier this country needs. I believe I can put together a coalition of people that can bridge these gaps of race and ethnic division and other divisions. The third thing that we got to deal with is what I would call the politics of denial and the easy answer. Americans have always hated politics. You know, Jerry Brown has been cynical about politicians. Yeah, always. And the problem and they is have some right to be. Absolutely. Because the very act of politics itself is, is well, when, well, there's is some compromise. Compromise is and, wheeling and, and, and is, not so much wheeling and dealing, is but is negotiations with the Congress. Yeah. Representatives of the Absolutely. people. Absolutely. And is also is exercise. Of limits. And nobody's perfectly wise. So when you exercise authority over other people's lives and you're not perfect, there's bound to be disappointment. There's bound to be something that doesn't happen that should or something that happens that shouldn't. But the thing that bothers me is that, that under Reagan and Bush, our presidents denied responsibility for the problems. They often denied they existed. They tried to blame somebody else for what problems existed. And they were always trying to divide up the country. So my third mission would be to at least say, hey, let's have a grown up as president who takes take responsibility for the future of this country. Stop trying to divide us. And he'll say at some point, I don't care whose fault it is anymore. I'm just tired of brain dead politics. I want to try some new things and I'll take responsibility. What new things uh, will you be? How will it, we all remember you and I do, especially when uh, John Kennedy took over the presidency. It was a different feeling in the country. It was the passing of the torch to a new generation. If a torch is passed, if Bill Clinton is elected president, what will be different? Different. Number one, we'll have the first national economic strategy to compete in a global economy that we don't dominate, that we've ever had. We'll give more incentives. That's to not the, let me just interrupt you, because that is, I, there is a sense, on my part at least, and, and Governor Brown talks about it, and others talk about it, and you talk about it. When you talk about that strategy, I mean, what does the leadership of America have to say to those who feel disenfranchised by the government, who feel that the country is adrift, well, other than simply think. talking about a national no. economic strategy? Except what, what does the leader have to say? To the people. To the people to make them believe once again that government is capable of dealing with those things that make them feel left out. Well, first you have to say, here's what's happened to you. Under the way things are, here's what's happened to you. Middle class folks are working harder, longer, for less, and paying more for the essentials of life. The working poor are growing every day. People who work hard and can't even make a living. People who are left out of our boat are sinking and costing the rest of us a lot of money. Too many people on welfare. Too many people with critical illnesses like AIDS not being tended to. Too many kids in deep trouble. How are we going to change it? You have to say, how are we going to change it? First thing we got to do is recognize that the countries that are working, and there are countries where it's working better than it is in America. Where? Germany, where the average factory worker makes 20% more than the average American. And Japan, why is that? Because they're better organized, they're better educated, they're better led. And they're more and productive. They, and they're more productive. And they put, a they put their people first. 
Raising and educating children is a high value there. Continuing to be educated and trained is a high value there. Organizing the economy to keep manufacturing jobs at home and to help businesses export is a high value there. All the things that enable people to have the things they value, progress, home, family, children, education, training, affordable health care, that's what these countries that are working do. Why should those people and all of us who are looking for leadership now believe in you? Because of all the people running, I'm the only one that spent the last 11 years trying to understand the 1980s and working at it every day. I got up every day and went to work and tried to do these things. I learned from my mistakes. I learned from my successes. I learned from other people. I seriously studied this every day for a decade. How do you get and keep decent jobs? How do you solve social problems? How do you bring people together? How do you educate children? These are the things that I have lived with. These aren't just a bunch of words to me. The other people can run for office and come up with an idea in 1992 that they didn't even believe in in 1990. Is that Governor Brown? Yeah. He's got an idea in 92 he didn't believe in in 90. All he had was a contribution, so they had to come up with something else. So they cooked up this cock and bull tax plan, which is a disaster. What I'm doing is flows out of the commitment of my life to try to make sure every person gets to live up to the fullest of their God-given potential. That's what my whole life is about. You can make the point that you've been successful in delivering that message because you've got more delegates than anyone else and most people believe you're on the way to the nomination. New York will be a critical test. Could be a Waterloo, but it'll certainly be a critical test for you. There is the question though is why do you see the poll so high with respect to a dissatisfaction with the field? Well, I think there are two reasons for that. One is peculiar to me. Which is? And that is that I've received more generalized media attacks than anybody in recent history. More than Gary Hart? More than Tom Eagleton? They were gone, than... though. They left the field. They quit the field. Uh, from, from anybody who is running, who has a right to stay in, who's continuing to generate support. And so I haven't caught who I am and what I believe the, mess, the test of character is, and what I've done has not really caught up to all the attacks in people who don't know me yet and who haven't seen the campaigns. So that's the first thing. The other problem is a much more general problem, and that's what you might call buyer's remorse. That is, in the nature of this process, people get for somebody and they drop out, and then they're disappointed because their candidate's not there. And then the people that survive get beat up on. But they beat up on each other, the media beats up on them, you know, you find every flaw and all that sort of stuff. So they become disappointed. You know, if you go back to 1976, let me give you an example. Jimmy Carter was far along toward becoming the nominee. Jerry Brown entered then with his new politics message of that age, won five of the last six primaries. Jimmy Carter came in third in the New York primary. That's right. So one of the, thing, one of the problems I have is that if you win the early races because people think this guy is going to really change things, he is committed to a crusade to change this country, and you win, and others aren't there, then when you're left standing, you're then the problem. You're the establishment because you won in other places. Does that grate at you that you're considered the establishment? Oh, yeah. It bothers me a lot. I mean, why? Because I, because I don't want to tear this country down, and I don't mind working with the establishment, but I have always been about change in politics. But the argument I is wouldn't be here tonight if I weren't a change agent. I wouldn't have... Because I you wouldn't, wouldn't have survived in Arkansas or because wouldn't you wouldn't have survived the primaries? Either one. I, I definitely wouldn't have survived in Arkansas. And I certainly wouldn't have survived the primary if I'd been an establishment status quo politician. But what I do is bring people together who haven't been together before. Let me Business and labor. We'll be right back. Governor Bill Clinton from Arkansas is here, one of the two prime principal candidates in the New York City prime in the New York primary. We'll have more conversation for the rest of this hour. Stay with us. We're back with Governor Bill Clinton. Let me just come back to running for president and, and the experience you have because I've seen one magazine writer after another say this is one of the best politicians on the stump they've seen in a long time. There's also this notion about you, that this strategy for this campaign, how to run, was one that came out of your mind, that is not a product of, A, a consultant, neither the words nor the road map, that this is something that you, in a sense, as a pol political person, as a governor, someone who's been watching politics and wanting national leadership, read a lot talked to a lot of people, and thought about how to fashion a campaign. That's right. Is that true? It is the true. The strategy for this campaign. It is true. What was the strategy? 
What was the motivation? What was the well, purpose? Well, you have to understand where I start. I mean, I have seen campaign after campaign after campaign fail because someone ran for president who just wanted to be president. You got to have a reason for running bigger than yourself. And it has to be rooted in your ultimate motivation for being in public life in the first place. I mean, the reason I wanted to be in public life when I was a kid is that I wanted to help my state lift itself educationally because I grew up in a poor state and I wanted it to do better because I wanted to do something about civil rights because I hated racism and bigotry. Those were the driving desires of my childhood. As I got into public life and stayed in, the general thing that drove me was that what turns me on is trying to see, seeing people do better, seeing real results from efforts. I mean, I think the purpose of politics is to help everybody live up to their fullest potential. I got into this race because I was convinced that the parties in Washington were gridlocked in a fight about the 80s. The Republicans said, keep taxes low and everything will be fine. The Democrats were worried more about dividing the pie. My view was that both parties were wrong. I had a way of building a new coalition for change and turning this country around. And that's what I did. And all my, my speeches, my position papers, everything I've worked out has come out of this work I've done as a governor and the study I've done and the, the discussions I've had with my friends. But here's what they say about your term as governor, that after you served the first two terms, your first term, the first two years, you lost. And you, some say you lost touch with the people. Others say that Bill Clinton after that was a different man and he was more cautious, he was more willing to compromise, and he was less willing to get out front except for a couple of issues, one being teachers and education. Uh, that that defeat made you a more conservative and prudent man and scared the heck out of you. Well, I think it made me, it did make me more prudent, but it also made me able to, to affect more change. As if you go back to that first term, there's a great little book that a woman who now works for me wrote about my first term. We were on the cutting edge of every change, but we didn't pay much attention to our voters, the people who hired me to do the job. So I got beat after one term, and lots of other reasons I lost, but I got beat. And then a guy came in and undid everything I tried to do, just about. So in the end, were people's lives changed by what I did? Not very much. So then I got back in. And one of the things I decided was you have to pick one or two things that you're focusing on at a time. And I knew in my state, as poor as it was, getting no help from Washington until we reorganized the education system and dramatically improved the education of our children and our adults, and until we tried to restructure our own economic system, developed our own economic policy, if you will, and our own strategy, we weren't going to be able to do much of anything else. So I took on those challenges with an obsession, with a vengeance and I fought for the changes I thought we needed. Now along the way, I took on almost all the interest groups. I also fought for campaign finance reform. I also fought for lobby disclosure and ethics law. I've also fought for changes in the way we regulate the, our environment, which got me in trouble with interest groups. I have taken on all these interest groups, but it's almost like the people who remember my first term wanted me to be another one-termer. Yeah, but those same people will come at your record as governor of Arkansas and say he didn't take on enough interest groups because he was pro-business at the, at the expense of the environment. Uh, they'll make that point. They and that and there are a lot of other times in which you looked at the powerful interest groups in Arkansas and a compromise, a political compromise was reached. The, the compromises we reached were reached when it was necessary to get something done to help people. What I like to be judged by is whether we made a difference given where we started, are we going in the right direction? I mean, look at my state. We were one of the poorest states in the country. We got the highest high school graduation rate in the South. We're 15th in the ratio of students to teachers in school. We're in the top 10 in the ratio of computers to kids in school. We tripled enrollment in computer science, advanced math, and foreign languages in just a couple of years. We've done all these things because I stayed the course. And, we, and we've also taken on all the educational interests at one time or another, and I have repeatedly been willing to raise taxes for schools. Let me give you another example. I got the, the, the business community in my state last year, the executive board of the Chamber of Commerce voted to raise the corporate income tax to put it into two-year education programs for job training and education for working people. I bet that didn't happen anywhere else in America. And, and I think that is a testament 
to trying to build a different coalition for change. Was I pro-business and pro-growth? You bet I was. If people don't have jobs, nothing else good happens. Yeah, but you attacked, you attacked Paul Songus when he was running as, as a pro-business candidate and the candidate of Wall Street. Nope. I didn't. I didn't attack him for being a pro-business candidate. You never said he was a candidate of Wall Street? No, he said he would be the best president Wall Street right. ever had. I, I differed with him because I thought my growth strategy was better than his. I was for targeted tax incentives and removing those incentives to move our jobs overseas or for unwarranted executive compensation. He felt that in addition to targeted tax incentives, we ought to have capital gains tax cuts. The argument I made was that we tripled the stock market in the 80s, but wages went down. We lost our competitive position. And you said that on Wall Street today and the people That's booed right. you. They did. They did, but they chaired a lot of the rest of the things I said. You can't, you got, look, if you got a speech, you got to give it everywhere. You got to tell people things they don't want to hear. Let me talk about the New York primary again and, and some of the issues there. Governor Brown here last night said that he would consider, and that he, I asked him the direct question, would you offer the vice presidency to Jesse Jackson? He said, yes, I would. Would you consider Jesse Jackson as your running mate? I have adopted a policy of not discussing personalities in the vice presidency. I've done it for two reasons. One is, I made them, I was in two states where the press asked me, would you consider this person? And I said, I admire them, and of course I would, which is standard political gar uh, rhetoric, you know. And then they turned around and attacked me for pandering for answering a question that they asked me. So that bothered me. The second thing is mo much more deep. I think George Bush still carries the wounds of the perception that he picked Dan Quayle for purely political reasons. You know, that he just kind of woke up at that convention after having been yeah. vice president for eight years and did that. So let me just say, I'll be glad to tell you what I think about Jesse Jackson, where we agree and where we disagree. But I have made a decision that I'm going to try to make this selection without playing with personalities and stringing people along and building people up or taking them down. And that the one thing I want people to say, just like this, when I name a vice presidential candidate is, boy, there's somebody that'd be a good president. Jesse Jackson, Governor Brown ran in some flack today from Jewish groups because of, of the, probably the reservoir of some hostility between Jesse Jackson and Jewish groups from previous campaigns and, and words that were exchanged between the candidate and Jewish groups during the 88 campaign. Would you rule Jackson out? because you understand the sensibilities and the sensitivities of Jewish Americans. Well, let's talk about that issue. Okay. First of all, there were other reasons he got in trouble. He also went to Wall Street and read off the names of some of my Wall Street contributors, apparently, and said he was going to drive the money changers from the temple. And a lot of them thought that was anti-Semitic. And he said also he would suspend all foreign aid, including all foreign aid, until March, until he got to New York. So he's got other problems with the Jewish vote. I talked to, interestingly enough, I talked to Jesse Jackson about this issue and his problems in the Jewish community at Gracie Mansion a few days ago when we were both there for the mayor's forum. Right. And I have to tell you, you know, I've had some differences of opinion with Reverend Jackson and they've been somewhat publicized. And I don't agree somewhat with him. Somewhat captured on camera. Yeah, yeah, one of them was captured on camera. And I don't agree with him. Uh, on the Middle East, and we would handle that in different ways. I'm, I'm very upset about the way George Bush has handled the Middle East. But I do not believe that Jesse Jackson, in his heart, wishes to be separated from any person in America by virtue of their race or ethnic origin. And uh, he told me a story about actually praying for uh, the wife of a Jewish man who was uh, in terrible shape in a hospital and who admired him very much. And it was obviously something that had stayed with him. And I say this to say that, that uh, I would hope that, that we could all find a way to bring these racial and ethnic feelings really out into the open, but not in a shouting match in public, but really to sit down and talk with one another about them. Because a lot of people think race is the issue in America. A lot of people think ethnic division is the issue in America. I believe that, that, the go ahead. That, that are gripping us and causing us problems. I believe that, that the diversity of this country can be one of our greatest strengths in a world which is rapidly changing. I think our diversity can be a source of great strength, but only if we reach out to one another. And, and all I can tell you is that I don't think Jesse Jackson believes 
that he has an anti-Semitic bone in his body, and I'd like to see him given a chance. And you take his word for that, and you believe that he doesn't either. I, I think you have to take him at his word, but what I would like to see him do is to find a way to reach out to the Jewish community and say, I disagree with Bill Clinton and you on the Middle East, but when it comes to Americans, without regard, or, or people around the world, they are all children of God, and I harbor no bigotry in my heart. I mean, he has apologized for that, all, that terrible remark he made. And all the things that you say are admirable, and, but then some people in the community here would want you to, to know specifically whether you rule him out. Everything you've just said is admirable and comes from your heart and shows a, a, a real sensitivity and sense of, and sense of understanding understand about that. the dilemma, but they'd like to know where you stand, well, as Governor Brown has expressed himself, where he stands. Well, because they see it as a symbol. I know that. And Governor Brown has chosen to define himself in terms of that symbol. Yeah. I choose not to define myself in terms of that symbol. The, the Jewish community here knows that I've taken on George Bush over issues over the Middle East, and I did it back when it wasn't popular in states where there wasn't a big Jewish vote, because I believe that the parties are now at the peace table. And I think that settlements issue needs to be resolved there. And I think the way the president has has handled this has been dead wrong. Let me move to the question that you talked about, which is racism. And you have some people that uh, certainly I, as a son of the South, admire. John Lewis is, is, is a man that is much to be admired because of his commitment to the civil rights struggle. I know no one who's risked their life more and who was on the front lines of the, one of the most important movements in this century, which is the civil rights movement. And he went to jail and suffered for it. And he's supporting your candidacy. You have shown in Arkansas, by appointment of people in other ways, you know, a commitment to civil rights. Some will look at you and say, why doesn't Arkansas have a civil rights law? And you've received some criticism of that. Others know that you are as smart a politician that has come down the pike in a long time, both in terms of the politics of the thing as well as a policy nut, as they have described you. And they wonder, how could Bill Clinton have played golf at that country club? Let me answer the civil rights law thing okay. first. First of all, most states which have civil rights laws basically have laws which permit you to sue in state court for something you could sue in federal court for. There was never any pressure in my state for a state civil rights law. When we had a good federal civil rights law in the books before the Supreme Court started to undo it, even my minority legislators never asked about it. It was never even an issue at home. We had so many other civil rights battles we were fighting and winning on and moving forward on, never came up. Now in 1991, the black legislators in the Arkansas legislature and some white legislators wanted a tough civil rights law, one that would have put Arkansas in the very forefront of civil rights legislation. I agreed to support it. I fought hard for them. They could have gotten a law like other laws, basically tracking the federal law but letting you sue in state court. They declined it. They turned it down cold. They said, we're going to wait until the Congress acts on civil rights law, and we're going to come back here in two years and pass another law. Every legislator who fought for civil rights in my state will tell you that I supported their position, I worked hard for it, and I was, I was out there working for it. But does it. that say something about your political effectiveness at all? No. Does it say something about no, your ability to get a legislature to go with you and, well, and follow your own my No, because my legislature adopted the most sweeping reforms in the least amount of time this year as in, in the history of the state. This issue came up without adequate preparation, I think, for the, the opponents. And the opponents beat us on the theory that let's wait and see what Congress does. But we're going to pass a law next time. Now, you want to talk about the golf course? Yes. I didn't see this in the way I now did. And I'll explain why. The golf course, I am not a member of that golf course. The governor gets playing privileges at all these clubs. I did know they didn't have any black members. I know they are actively recruiting black membership now and were at that time. The guy that I played with is the campaign manager for a black judge who's running for a higher judgeship now. Also equally committed as am I, to equal rights. The, because blacks are allowed to play at the golf course, use the other facilities, as one of my supporters who came to New York to campaign for me reminded me I held an integrated pr program there ten years ago. Everybody knows everything that you've just said. and They so don't know everything yeah. I just said. No, they don't. The Jerry Brown ad deliberately misrepresented that. They don't know. Did I make a mistake? Yes, I did. Did I own up to it? Yes, I did. Would I have played there if the facilities had been segregated? No, I would not. Now, you're going to measure... And you would not play there again? 
not until they integrate the club. Yeah. Now, he, here's now uh, what, uh, my, uh, wait a minute. Okay, I got one point. All right, I just want to make this. Well, go, you make your point. My point was it. the following, is that I am told that your staff, maybe I was told wrong, that your staff, before you even played golf there, alerted you to this kind of problem, you know, and wondered why did you do it? I mean, was it just a momentary lack of, of judgment on your part? No. That, no. that you were aware of this there, no, and, and it was no. part of your consciousness and that something no. Point to the country. didn't play. No, there something had already been a story about in. this. The story had been, no, that's the irony of this. And my staff asked me if I belonged to any segregated clubs. I said no, but I do have playing privileges at one club that I believe is still segregated, best of my knowledge, and I have played golf there. But I don't pay dues there, and, and the playing privileges are integrated. That was reported and widely reported in the press. So there was a news story on it, right. which is why I did not think any more about it. It was reported in the press because one of our opponents, um, one of the participants in this race, I don't remember which one, had actually belonged to a segregated club, and I never had. So that's why I didn't think about it. Then when the reaction came out, I thought, well, I really, even if blacks can play here, I shouldn't play here until they integrate the membership. But the only thing I'd like to say is, I don't just have a civil rights record. I mean, it's no accident that I have three African-American congressmen and the only Puerto Rican congressman in the country here in New York supporting me. It's no accident that Congressman John Lewis and Mike Espy, the first black congressman right, from Mississippi, Mississippi right. and Bill Jefferson from New Orleans. None of that's in question, that's right. as you know. But what, what is in what question is, is, why did you do it? And I still don't understand. I did it because I, 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 I literally had a mental lapse. The whole thing had been out in the open. I had acknowledged playing lapse. golf there. It, wasn't, it was a lapse. I was, it was just a mistake. I was too tired. We were in a hurry. We were trying to play nine holes of golf. It was the quickest place to do it. We went out there and played nine holes of golf. It was just a mistake. Governor Bill Clinton, back in a moment. Stay with us. <music> Governor Bill Clinton is here. You want to make one more point about civil well, rights I want to make and about, about the, civil the country club thing. Is that all I asked was to be viewed in the light of the thousand victories I've had yeah. in this area. I mean, the reason I've had this overwhelming support from the minority communities is they know where my heart is and they know what my record is. Let me give you an idea. I mean, and that's why this ad Brown ran was so unfair. I mean, you know, Jerry Brown was reporting the Village Voice this week as having said previously that one solution to our problems would be for white kids to teach black kids to read and black kids to teach white kids to fight. He said on another occasion, he didn't understand we were giving school lunches to kids. He never needed a school lunch. Now, surely Jerry Brown didn't really mean that. But I could have taken those quotes yeah. and run a big television ad and gotten everybody back who left me because of what I did. And I think that it's very important in dealing with these issues of race. I think number one I learned is running for president that every word you say, every gesture you make, no matter how private it may be, is never private again and has enormous power to wound or to elevate. But I also think that those of us in public life should try as much as we can to, to confine our differences to the things that will throw out into the yeah. future. Here is what someone asked me today. I said that you were coming. They said, here is their impression. They said, here is a guy who's competent and tough, and he stood up there, and he's taken a lot of licks, and he's still standing, and in fact, he's leading, and he's got more delegates, and most people believe he probably will get the nomination unless he trips. Now, having said that, they also want to know the following. They said, here's a guy and perhaps it says something about where he came from who wants to be loved, he wants to be liked. Maybe that goes with being an actor or a politician or on television, that's part of the turf. And they want to know, therefore, if Bill Clinton is president, tell me five things he's going to do that's going to make people angry, that's going to turn them off. Who's he going to take on and say, you are the enemy and I am drawing the line in the sand and under Bill Clinton, it's going to be different? Well, for one thing, I'm going to take on the health insurance companies and the health care bureaucracies and everybody that's resisted giving us a national health care system all this time. For another thing, I'm going to be... Take them on and do what? I'm going to give us affordable national health care system with dramatic reforms that will cut a lot of the money that's going into those people and what they're doing. It's going to be a big change. And where for, is the money coming from? The money's going to come out of them for, in the beginning. 
we're only getting 84 cents on the health care dollar going into health care. All the Europeans with health insurance companies involved get 95 cents. That's 60 billion dollars we're losing that ought to be going into the health care of Americans and I'm going to go get it. For another thing, I'm going to ask the people who made a lot of money in the 1980s and had their tax rates lowered to pay their fair share again. I don't want another 10 years where the top 1% of the American people get 60% of the growth. That's what I got booed on. To in pay their fair today. share by increasing uh, the personal income tax rate for That's right. people over a certain income. That's right. From how much to how much? We'll go from 31 to either to 37, over $200,000 joint, or to 35 with the surtax on millionaires that Senator Benson mm -hmm. proposed. Let me come back and, and sort of look at a broader political I'll spectrum. I'll give you some more people I want to oh, make mad. All right, I know, but let me, let me come to this other thing. Tell me what books you've been reading. What's made a difference? Give me some sense of, of what's shaping you now. I'm reading now, uh, just at the moment, uh, Ward's biography of Roosevelt before he became president because there's, there seem to be parallels in what people said about him and criticizing him. They said he was slick? Slick was too ingratiating, liked to make everybody happy. He made a lot of differences in life. So I thought maybe I could learn some things from what he did and from the defining moments of his life and, uh, and also just because I'm interested in him and, and that. I just read a book called Millennium by Jacques Attali. Right. Who used to work for Mitterrand. Right, an economist. Basically saying that our best days are behind us right. and their best days are ahead. I don't believe that, but I wanted to it's no. true unless we change. It is true unless we change, and I believe that uh, very, very deeply. If you had to look at this campaign, tell me a defining moment for you. Tell me a moment in which you wondered if there would be a tomorrow for the Clinton campaign, for Bill Clinton's dream of being president, and where you really had to say, this is a time to show when I made out. When the, um, it's funny, but when, when, when the, um, when the television uh, network guy showed me the letter I'd written in Vietnam, as if that were going to sink the ship, you know, I said to myself, yeah, I wrote that letter, and that's the way I felt then. And if the American people don't want to vote for me because I felt that way then, then that's fine with me. I'll go home. I understand that. And then we decided that I would go on Nightline and discuss it, and that we would run that letter in the newspapers in New Hampshire. And uh, so basically the last eight days of the New Hampshire primary were about my character. I lost the New Ideas race to Senator Saunders because, which I had been winning, because people forgot all about my ideas, and I'm still fighting to get my ideas back into this race, because that's why I got into this race, because I had so many new ideas, and I wanted to change the country. But that was a defining moment, because I had to say, look, I've been telling you all along, I've not been a perfect person, but the measure of character is the depth of your feeling. Do you believe in things? Do you try to live by them? And do you try to do better? This is from the AP today. The Democratic presidential frontrunner Bill Clinton is more vulnerable to attacks on his character than President Bush is to criticism of his record in office, according to a nationwide poll released Thursday. Do you, why is that? I mean, why is it because I that have, because your character continues to be so troubling? Because I keep having to answer questions like this no, unrelated to specifics. A, a no, I don't mean, I'm not asking you to explain I understand that. No, but what I'm saying is, it's a thing that feeds on itself, you know, and if voters don't know me, if they don't get a chance to get to know me, all they hear are these amorphous character questions. If you think about it, the only character question that's really been raised about me was the first one. You know, the allegations the relationship with in the Star magazine, absolutely. Yeah. And I did my best to answer those things forthrightly, but to repeat again on 60 Minutes, not easy to tell the world that I had troubles in my marriage, that I had caused pain, that I regretted that, that I had suffered for it, that I had paid for it in that way, but that I was awfully proud yeah. that I had kept my marriage together. The bizarre thing about that is if, if you I had divorced, if, it would not absolutely. have been an issue. But and you know that's true. Yeah. You know that's but true. What and here we seem say, to be saying, too, is, that, you know, it's almost like what people are looking for, they're looking for honesty in your life. And if, in fact, someone stepped forward to have, say that I have evidence or that Bill Clinton has lied, 
Should that eliminate Bill Clinton from consideration for president? Well, let me answer you in this way. I have answered more questions about more issues in my personal life than anybody I know about. Right. I believe, I have always tried to be truthful with the American people. The one thing that's so strange to people at home about this campaign, let me just yeah. finish this, is that the one thing nobody ever questioned about me before as a public official was whether I was honest in my public life. It has never been questioned. But you agree this, then that, that it ought to be a principal test of any man or any woman's capacity to be president? I do, except I think there are some personal questions that no one should ever have okay. to answer. Let me change subject and end with... I believe there are some personal questions no one should ever have to answer. Having to do with relationship that, that, that injure other family. people, absolutely. Right. Let I me, think people have a right to protect their family. I remember... Um, I'm out of time, I felt that four years ago. Can you... Do you remember every line of every Elvis song? No, but I remember a lot of them. Would you just hum one to give us a little sense of your favorite? We were listening a little bit of Elvis as we were going out here. But you know I don't have a voice. I'm too hoarse. <laughs> give us your best Elvis. My, my best Elvis yeah. is weak tonight. All right. You know I can be found. That's all I can do. <laughs> Sitting home all alone. If you can't come around, at least please telephone my message to the New York press. Don't be cruel. <laughs> <laughs> but you, I'm Governor. too hoarse. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Governor Bill Clinton, um, voters will make a decision about his candidacy on Tuesday. Tuesday. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow night.